How's it going? I'm I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I was out at UCLA football practice yesterday, um, and that's usually an early morning for me. So taking it a little bit easier today and, and uh, was obviously looking forward to today's conversation with you. Uh, what are you um, – how are you doing today, and, and what do you have going on the rest of the week? Well, I had a lovely night last night watching game two of the WNBA finals. Have to give a shout out to former Los Angeles Sparks all-star point guard champion, Chelsea Gray. I mean, she did her thing again for what seems like the fifth or sixth straight game. Like she's just playing out of this world right now. Honestly, she's probably like top two in the world right now. This stretch she's having is unbelievable, but it's something that Sparks fans knew all too well from Chelsea Gray. Like there was a point when the team was everybody. It was, you know, Candace Parker, Neka Agumake, Chelsea Gray, Elena Beard. And they were saying, this is Chelsea Gray's team. And now I see why, because they knew this was there the whole time. And if they could tap into that, you know, who knows where the Sparks would be right now if they could have had Chelsea Gray consistently playing like this the whole time. If she was playing like this the whole time, I don't even know if she would have left, man. So that I'll that leads right into my question, and I'll get to that in a second. But for those of you who are just tuning in or who are listening back onto the or listening back to this later on on the recorded spaces, just want to welcome you guys in and for tuning in. Um, over to the spaces again. My name is James H. Williams. I am a reporter and assistant sports editor for the Orange County Register and the Southern California News Group. I'm also joined here today by John W. Davis, who's a reporter for the Press Telegram and a beat writer for the Southern California News Group covering the LA Sparks and the WNBA. Um, so, John, that leads right into the question H- How did Gray get away? Well, she got away because it was honestly a two-year process, and she was able to document this in a documentary. So she took a visit to Las Vegas the year before she left. So she left before the 2020 season, Mm -hmm. and so she took a visit 2019, her last year here. But before that, she took a visit to, to Las Vegas. You know, they wined and dined her. They showed her all they had to offer. Mm-hmm. And then she said, no, nah, you know what? I'm going to stay with the Sparks. But that was the beginning of the end of Chelsea Gray being on the Sparks, being that she sort of took her, took that first little baby step into free agency. And planted that seed, no? Yeah, and they planted that seed. And, you know, just for comparison, that may be the same thing that a team like the New York Liberty would try to do with um, Seattle Storm uh, MVP, Brianna Stewart. Like, she took a visit with the Liberty, and nobody thought she was actually going to leave. She didn't. But, you know, she tested out free agency. And that's the great thing about where we're at right now in the WNBA mm-hmm. is that the players can truly control what team they want to end up on. Because you can always work out the salaries and different things like that. Players have shown they're willing to take less than what their true maximum value is worth. And so – if you really, really, really want to be on a team for some particular reason, you can pretty much make your way onto that team. Right. And the the one thing that stands out to me, um, you know, and I guess all of this ties back to the Sparks at the end of the day is, um, you know, I guess things maybe didn't finish the way Candace Parker would have wanted to this year. But even for her to get away and, and still to have some of the um, the good stuff she's been able to do on the court, especially the last couple months here, but was it just a matter of her really wanting to go back home or were things, and we'll get into the, the Sparks like main situation here in terms of what their future is going to look like, but was a lot of those early rumblings and a lot of the early happenings that were seen with the Sparks, did that also play into to Parker leaving when she did? Well, the first year Candace Parker was here under Derek Fisher, not her first year, but Derek Fisher's first year, yeah. it ended with Candace Parker being benched and 2019, they were playing a home game in the – they were playing the Sun in the semifinals, I believe, of the playoffs. And they were playing a home game, but it wasn't at Staples because, you know, oh. not just because Staples wasn't called – it was Staples then. Like, it wasn't at Crypto, it wasn't at Staples. None of that. They actually played a home game at the Pyramid. Your yeah. School, Long Beach State. So. Yeah. 
they were kicked out for like the, the Grammys or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, you know, they're down 2-0 in this series. They come back home and they're down again. And Derek Fisher just, you know, he has enough. And Candace Parker just doesn't get back in the game. She only plays like 11 minutes or something like that. And I think that was probably the start of her like truly, truly, truly thinking like, you know what, I might have to leave to to accomplish something. And then when everything was able to align with Chicago, because, you know, she has a very personal connection to James Wade. Uh She is James Wade's child's godmother. James Wade coached on a team that she played for in Russia. So, like, that's essentially, like, family to her. And on top of that, to be able to go home, yeah, and play in front of her family. You know, she mentioned being able to play in front of her grandmother, and you know, be able to go over her house, and you know, the fact that her mom can cook her meals, and her dad can come over, and I don't know, do do something like, you know, he can come over, and I don't know, I'm just gonna make up something. He can come over and and, and help with you know lawn work. I don't know. There you go. Whatever. Or he, he can, he can just stuff. come over, come over and hang out with the dogs. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. So, like the fact that everybody was there for her, like that was just icing on the cake. And she was super familiar with the coach. And then you see what happened. The first year she goes there, she wins a WNBA championship. So obviously, you know, she made the right decision for her, but she is technically going to be a free agent in 2023. But she's also kind of going back and forth about retirement or maybe she's not, but I think it's maybe the media is, it's kind of been out there when, and she's kind of saying when her body, when she feels she's ready, she'll she'll kind of make that decision, right? Is that yeah? But you know what, James? She's been saying that since I started covering the team in 2019. She's okay. always since then. She's always right. said that she has, you know, more games behind her than in front of her. And she was saying that right. in her, you know, earlier 30s. You know, now she's mid 30s. So obviously, she's going to keep saying that because yeah, like she's been playing professional basketball in the WNBA for more than a decade. Obviously, she's not going to play another decade. So, yeah, like, eventually, she's definitely closer to retirement Mm -hmm. than she is, you know, to her rookie season when she won MVP for the Sparks. But, you know, I I just can't call it. Like, part of me can see Candace Parker being the type of player who just, you know, just walks away like Barry Sanders. You know, I'm retired. Mm -hmm. But, But then, you know, she's such a great player, and she's starting to truly get the recognition that she deserves like I feel like she would need a a retirement year like we just got with you know Sue Bird and Sylvia Fowles so you know when you're going around to these different teams in the league you know they can recognize you so you know I I personally think whenever Candace Parker decides to retire I would like for everybody to know beforehand so that everybody can give her the appreciation now instead of later. Definitely giving her the flowers that she deserves. And yeah, so again, uh, my name is James. I'm talking to John. We're talking on the Twitter spaces. Both of us work for the Southern California News Group, uh, which includes the Orange County Register and the Daily News. Um, Make sure you guys go ahead and check out John Sparks coverage and WNBA coverage over at ocregister.com and dailynews.com. Um, but, John, um, one thing that also stood out to me, and we'll get into some more Spark stuff, but obviously a big topic in the WNBA was Brittany Griner. And something that sticks out to me was, I think I saw something where, I, I don't know if the rule changed recently, but there was something where um, it was like a post-game press conference for uh, one team or another, and the players were debating on something on whether they were even going to play next year because there's some – restriction on if you if you go overseas and play then maybe you won't um you know you won't make it back in time for start w some something like that but yeah it's called it's called prioritization and so the WNBA's ultimate goal is for Mm -hmm. their players to not have to go overseas and so to truly get to that then obviously you're going to have to have salaries that are essentially matching what somebody can make overseas and the top players overseas Mm -hmm can make more than a million dollars. And so until they get much closer to that, then that's going to be tough. But what they're doing is now they're basically saying that like, you know, veterans, we feel like we're paying you. Well, not feel like we know we're paying you, 
you know, a decent amount more than what we used to pay you. So we expect you to be in training camp, you know, from mm-hmm. day one or be there by training camp. And then like, that's the expectation. Do whatever you have to do overseas, but be back when we tell you to be back in May. So, so I think, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, so that, I mean, that's sort of where we're at. And like, they can't tell rookies to do that because, I mean, rookies are still making, yeah, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, rookies make average maybe between sixty and 80000 So you can't tell them that, oh, no, you just have to sit here and wait. But, you know, I guess they feel like if they're paying somebody, you know, 200 and something thousand and then they have, you know, maybe a marketing deal and this is that and the other and, you put all that together and they're pushing 300,000. I guess they say, well, we want you to be available when we say you should be available. But then the other thing is about a couple of years from now, the WNBA should be renegotiating their TV deal, uh-huh. their broadcast deal. And with that, they should have a lot more money. And then if they do like they did this last time with the collective bargaining, they should be able to increase salaries significantly, in my opinion. And I'm so I mentioned Brittany Griner there earlier. And, and part of the question I wanted to ask, too, is what has there been any change in in the maybe the mindset of the players when in regards to going overseas, considering, you know, what happened with Brittany Griner um, and just like the whole situation there? Like, is there any sort of like, like, have you heard anything or is there anything along those lines where it's like, Mm, I don't know if maybe going overseas is the best option, at least right now, until some of this Brittany Griner stuff gets figured out. Obviously, there's different countries and different places. That yeah, they that's the thing. They have so many different countries they can go to is that they'll just most likely just choose to go to different countries. Yeah. I mean, there's there's basketball in Asia. Mm-hmm. A couple of those teams pay well. There's basketball in Australia. There's basketball in Israel. There's basketball in, you know, some of the other Uh, European countries or Middle Eastern kind of that area. Mm -hmm. Turkey has a big, huge league. So there's places these players can go. The thing about it is Russia paid the most. And so if they're not going to go there for the time being, which I don't think anybody is, then they're going to have probably lower salaries. And then that's definitely going to make somebody like you know, cherish that money they're getting over there too. So mm-hmm. like, I could see somebody saying, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to make up a number. I'm going to just go ahead and take this 600000 that whatever team is giving me and they want me to play until July. I'm just going to play until July. And, hey, you know what, I'm just going to let my $200,000 I was making in the WNBA go. Because then they would actually have a summer break as opposed to playing essentially year-round. A lot of these players maybe – get a month off some of them is as short as like a week off oh wow in between seasons yeah it's tough it's a full grinding commitment to to the sport right and i i mean and and that's what all athletes are about but when you don't have that true off season to kind of kind of recover and do what you have to do to, with your body like it can it can take a toll over time but um for those of you who are tuning in and hanging out with us um if you have a question that you want to try and ask john Send it over in a direct message to me. My my DMs are open, and I'll try and ask those questions to John, and we'll see if we can get um, some good questions in from you guys. But I have a question for you, John. Uh, just circling back here to the Sparks, uh, where are they at with this head coaching search with their general manager? Like, w- what are they doing at the top before they can even get to free agency and figuring out what's next on the court for this team? Well, James, you just asked what should be the million-dollar question. If you're talking about paying the salary of a GM and a coach, you might have to add all that up, and it might need to end up being a million dollars because we just saw Becky Hammond get a million dollars from Vegas. So, you know, maybe they reset the market. But right now, the Sparks do not have a head coach. They do not have a GM. And until they have a GM and a coach, there's nothing they can do, honestly, They don't even have an interim coach right now. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, the GM is essentially in charge of player personnel. And in a lot of structures, the GM is ahead of the coach. In most structures, 
So you would think that you would want a GM first before you hire the coach or you at least do them at the same time. So they're both aware of each other. Oftentimes in the WNBA, the coach becomes the GM. Yeah. So that's an option. So they just have to figure out what they want to do because that's, that's what they had when they first hired Derek Fisher. They had a GM named Penny Toller. Then she was let go. So then Derek Fisher was the he GM did. and the coach. Right. But then when he was let go, you let go not only your coach, but your GM. And so at that point, the Sparks haven't had a GM. They don't have a coach now. And so that you just you just don't do anything of significance until you have that because, you know, certain GMs, but especially certain coaches, can attract certain players. So and they have to sure that up first before they can do anything. Luckily for them, free agency technically doesn't start until like late winter 2023. So you can't really do anything right now. But, right. you know, they could be, you know, talking about things. They could be scouting. They could be having organizational meetings. They could be, you know, checking in on people's health and their, their wellness and different things like that. And they don't have anybody who can officially do that at that capacity right now. And Fisher goes out, Williams comes in, or was already there, but is elevated to that position, is my mm-hmm. understanding. And they decide that he wasn't the option for them um, going forward. What do, you, what do you think went wrong there? And um, do you, is there any names that can come to mind? Any, anyone that you think would be a good fit? Whether, whether at, at the moment it's like realistic or not, but is there anyone that, that you would like to see leading the way for the Sparks on the court? In terms of a coach? Yeah, first of all, let me kind of address the the Derek Fisher and then Fred Williams. So I believe Fisher was about five and seven or six and seven when they let him go. Uh So he wasn't winning. And then Fred Williams, his last 10 games, the Sparks went one and nine. Now, yes, Liz Cambage was gone and a lot of different things going on with the team. But, like, you have to win to – earn a job like that so they're 13 and 26 this year second worst record in the league this is the second consecutive year the sparks missed the playoff and only the second time that they've missed the playoffs two years in a row ever and the only other time they did that were the first two years in the league when the league didn't even have that many teams and barely that many teams even made the playoffs so this is unprecedented for the sparks to miss the playoffs twice but if we're talking about you know, if I say like GM is the most important because the GM has to be on one accord with the coach, then, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there and just just let it be what it is. This is mm-hmm. not based on sourcing or anything like that. But I would love to see somebody like Lisa Leslie be the GM. Sparks okay. legend. She knows everything about this organization. She's mm-hmm. technically a owner right now of the team. And from my estimation, you can be a part owner and a GM because there's precedence for that with um, in Dallas, the Dallas wings, their GM is Greg Bibb and he's a co-owner of the team. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, somebody like that, I think that I think she could, you know, cause she's well-respected. So I think she could recruit players. I think she has the basketball knowledge clearly, you know, she's done really well with the three on three. Yeah. And the big three. So like, You know, why not shoot for something like that? And then you can always fill in with an assistant GM who is more of the person who knows the the salary cap and all of that different stuff. But you need somebody who can connect with the players, first of all. And then, you know, you fill in what else you need with the analytics and all of that type of stuff. Yeah, especially as the as if, you know she's involved in ownership and whatnot. Like, have her come in and set that culture, right? And like, she's still involved. I think I still see videos. That's every the per- that's the perfect word for it, culture. Yeah. That's what they need mm-hmm. to do. They need a culture change with the Sparks, and then things can happen. So let's just go with the hypothetical that Lisa Leslie is your GM. So then, for coaches, I would say this hypothetical GM of Lisa Leslie should consider somebody like the Las Vegas Aces assistant coach, who was an L.A. Clippers assistant coach, Natalie Nikase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Consider her. She's, you know, in her early 40s. Obviously, she knows basketball. You know, she's on a team that is on their way to winning the WNBA championship. That's her first year as an assistant. 
with the WNBA right. and with the Aces. So that's a, a candidate. I would also say that a really good candidate is Sparks assistant coach Latricia Tremell because she's been here since 2019 and pretty much the whole time she's been in charge of the defense. And the best thing about the Sparks, the whole time she's been here, the whole time I've been covering the team, mm-hmm. is the defense. And so I think that's a person who could be elevated to the top chair and do well. And then if you're thinking like, oh, well, you know, you know, I don't know if I want to give a, a first-time coach a head, a first-time coach a, a chance because, you know, some people just don't want to do that. But honestly, like, how do you ever become a coach if somebody doesn't give you a chance? That's but, right. Let's just say if they didn't, then I will throw in one more name: an experienced coach, Pokey Chapman. Right now, she's assistant coach with the Seattle Storm. She's been the head coach of the Fever, the Sky, and coached in LSU. So she'll have the whole gamut of you know being able to you know scout players on the college level, you mm-hmm. know, talk to and recruit players on the professional level, and she knows X's and O's. And so those would be my three. And again, like. You know, I don't have these, somebody feeding me these names or anything like that. I'm just thinking to myself, like, those are three names, three coaches who I think all in their own right would be good. And the other thing I might do if I was GM Lisa Leslie, I might say, I might even do this too. I might say, hey, new coach, if it's not Coach Latricia Tremell, I would say, you need to keep her on your staff because that's what GMs do sometimes. They say, you know what? This is a coach I like. Yeah, they're not the head coach, but they're going to be the coach on the team. They're going to be a part of this program, maybe to have some continuity, because if she's not there, the whole staff is gone, but all of the players won't be gone. There's Yes, I know the Sparks have a lot of cap room, but there's going to be somebody who's on the team last year that's going to be coming back, and so it would be great to have some continuity. And again, like the defense has been the best part of the Sparks for the past four seasons, so you know, I don't know if you necessarily need to move away from that. You just need to upgrade your staff when it comes to players more so than anything else. And when it comes to players, as you mentioned, um, what's going on with the Agumake sisters? And what are, are we getting them back with the Sparks? Uh, next? Okay, James. So they're right. two for one special. This is what Chanae told me. She said, okay. wherever that- NECA goes, I go. Okay. So it's like that. And I don't see a reason for NECA to leave. She's told us over and over. She wants to be here in L.A. She's This is about legacy to her. And so if she's staying in L.A., then Chanae is staying in L.A. Mm-hmm. And then the good thing about L.A. for Chanae is, like, this is, other than New York, L.A. is the media capital yes. of the United States. It's number two. It's the number two market. She can do everything that she wants to do. And here. has been, right? And has been. Mm-hmm. And so she might as well just continue to do that here. So mm-hmm. I would I would probably pencil those two in. Now, the good thing about it is Chanae has, you know, other uh, financial means off the court. So yeah. if they really need some wiggle room salary wise, that's somebody who you might ask to say, OK, well, you know, you say you're a two for one deal. You know, you, we know you want to be on the team. We appreciate what you've done. But, hey, maybe just give us a little bit back on this salary so we can be a little bit more flexible um, on the team. And they may even do that again with NECA. The problem with that is, is, like, she is literally the president of the Players Union (laughs) but doesn't have a max contract. To To me, I feel like that just sets a bad precedent. Yes. Yeah, like you like if anybody should have a max contract, it should be the person who helped negotiate the contracts for everybody. As long as she's playing at the level that deserves it, of right. course. Right, yeah. which is an all-star yeah. starter. She was an all-star starter last year. She's still at that level. I think she right. finished 10th in the MVP voting. Like, she's still an all-WNBA level player, which mm-hmm. is worth a max contract. So I would say max her out and then start from there. And yeah, you talk about starting from there. What are some other options for the Sparks in in terms of who who should they be targeting in free agency once they get past uh, whatever needs to be done with their head coach, their GM? Um, Obviously, that's not free agency stuff. But then once you get the. No, no, I got you. There's one name, man. Yeah. And I can say it 
with two letters and a number. Okay. CP3. And I'm not talking about Chris Paul. You the think- first call, the first call you make is to Candace Parker, even if she hangs up on you. That's the first call okay. you make. Because th- yeah. because just like Chicago is home, LA is home. Like LA yeah. is actually more home to her now than Chicago actually is. Like Chicago is family home, but LA is physical home. Right. LA is where my child goes to school. LA is where my spouse lives. Like all mm-hmm. of that stuff. And so like so LA is the place moved. L- L- hmm? So she never moved moved. Like she I mean she like no, she No, because yeah. that that's the thing, James. She's you play from you right, you play from May until September. Right. In your market. And think about it, half the time you're on the road traveling. Mhm. So, like, you're not really going to move to the city that you sign with when you already have, you know, established roots and a home and everything here. And so I, I make that call to her. And, you know, if, if Lisa Leslie is making that call, she's going to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's not going to hang up on Lisa. You know what I'm saying? Or if it's somebody <laughs> of that caliber. Like, you don't hang up on Lisa. Hang, right. Right. If it's Lisa making that call and, and Coach Tramiel and they all on a three-way, she's not going to hang up on them. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the type of person who you can build the team with. Like, I think it is important for whoever this GM is and this coach, they need to be making these free agent decisions in concert with NECA Agumake and Candace Park. Well, I won't say Candace Park because she's not on the team. But let's just go with NECA Agumake. They need to be making these decisions in concert with NECA Agumake. Like, no longer do you just make things in a vacuum and then just say, hey, this is the team. We're just going to play with this team. Like, no. Like, again, NECA is literally the president of the players' union. She knows everybody, and everybody knows her. Why would you not use her in that position? Right. So are you saying that they should get the band back together? Well, Chelsea Gray's not coming back. Well, yeah, I mean, you're not gonna get the whole band back. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying that, I'm saying that, you should at least offer mm-hmm. a mea culpa to Candace Parker and tell her if she wants to come home, we will welcome you with open arms. Because this is the thing, Candace Parker can win as many championships with the Chicago Sky as she wants to. When she goes into the Naismith Hall of Fame yes. for basketball. She's going in as a Tennessee ball and an L.A. Spark. I was going to say the Sparks are going to retire her number, right? They better. <laughs> they better. Like, they, is is like, Lisa Leslie the only one? Or do, have, do they have others? No, they have a couple. They have, um, they have Lisa. They have Penny Toller, the former GM who actually made the first basket ever in the WNBA. Oh, wow. And there's, there's one more. I can't remember, but I can picture it. I think it's Delisha Milton Jones. Mm-hmm. And okay, and there could there could be another, but they don't have too many numbers retired, honestly. And and Candace Candace is a statue type of player, past retiring yeah. a number. Like you put a statue of her outside of whatever they want to call this arena. By the time they get ready to do the statue, can I can I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. And this this just coming this just came to mind. That's now, okay. Here, I trust you. Is is Parker was. Candace Parker's career with the Sparks better than Lisa Leslie? Because Lisa doesn't have a statue, right? Or does she? Lisa doesn't have a statue either. She, they do. They don't have any statues for. Okay, so that's the only reason why. I, that's the only reason why I asked that. I can't answer. I can't answer that question. Um, okay, they're just just different, different careers. Yeah. I mean, they. The great thing about it is they did right. overlap. Right. They did overlap, right. and so like. That's the thing. They, like they won a title the, together, right? Yes. Well, okay. no, they actually didn't. I thought they did. They tried. They tried to, but they didn't. No, no, no. This, those championships came early. They didn't come later. In um, Lisa. because Candace Parker, believe it or not, she only won one championship with the Sparks, and Lisa Leslie won two, but they were earlier, earlier on. They were back to backs with Michael mm-hmm. Cooper as the coach. But like, this is the thing about the Sparks. Like, up until Candace Parker left. There had always been Lisa Leslie or Candace Parker on the Sparks. Like yeah. that's how much those right. two players mean to the team. That's why I can't pick one. No, and I, then Neca is that is that new person. So, correct. like they've never had a Sparks team that didn't feature 
one of those three players. Right. And hopefully next year, 2023, is not the beginning of them having a Sparks team where they don't have any one of those three players. Because no. that, that would be devastating for Sparks fans. And I think it would just be – it would set the the Sparks back. And, like, it's not – like, like that was the problem with this year. So the Sparks finished 13-23, and 23, had the second-worst record, but they didn't have a lottery pick. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a draft pick. They had already traded their number one draft pick away to the Atlanta Dream and the then the Washington Mystics. They're so smart that they said, hey, can we get a pick swap on that on that uh, Sparks pick? Because I guess they were thinking, well, if, if this doesn't work, it'll be better than our pick. And now the now they're going to have a, uh, a lottery pick again, the Mystics. Mm-hmm. So, you know, th- that's the thing. And then, you know, the other thing about not having a draft pick is, you know, salaries are only so high in the WNBA. Let me let me pull up what the salary cap is going to be for next year. Okay. So next year, they'll have about one point four million dollars for the whole team. That's for all twelve spots. But the good thing about having rookies, as I was talking about, like rookies can only make so much. So mm-hmm. having people on rookie deals allows you to control their contract for four years and they never get close to making a hundred thousand dollars in that time for right. most rookies. And so like you have to have below uh below median contract numbers. Like mm. let's say the median contract is a hundred and fifteen thousand. Like you gotta have some below because you're definitely gonna have some above. Like we're already talking about maxing out NECA, like literally giving NECA the max, which is gonna be two hundred and something. So they're in a they're in a really tough situation. But the good thing about the Sparks is they only have two veterans under contract right now, Kennedy Carter and Katie Lou Samuelson. And yep. then three forest rookies. They have Jasmine Walker, Ray Burrell, Olivia Nelson Adota, and Kiana Smith. But all of those contracts are technically unprotected. And so if and what that means is that they can cut any of those players without any financial Burden. Gotcha. If it comes down to it, and they don't think one of those players should be on the Sparks next year, they just get rid of them, and it doesn't hurt them. And does, does that mean un- when you what you say? Does that mean that there's not some guaranteed money there, or there is guaranteed money? Okay. There. So let me go. Let me go through had the guaranteed money for last season or this past season. Neko mm-hmm. Gumake had a guaranteed contract. Chris Oliver had a guaranteed contract. Amanda Zowie B had a guaranteed contract, but they suspended her contract. Janae Gumake had a uh, protected contract, and Jordan Canada had a protected contract. That was it. You get about six protected contracts on your team. And so right now they don't have any. And so the Sparks are in a great position where maybe they can convince a team, say, hey, trade us somebody with a high salary you don't want, but then give us a first mm-hmm. round pick too. You see what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like they can take on salary like you see some teams do every once in a while to they can basically essentially buy a first round pick by taking on somebody's salary in a roundabout way. Who has like one year left or, or mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, sometimes teams do it for more than that. And then they just, you know, will buy somebody out. But mm-hmm. yeah, I would I would suggest to them that they shouldn't take on anybody who has more than a year left. Like if they have a year. Okay. Because like a a WNBA roster is 12 players. There's some teams that roll with 10 all season. There's a lot of teams that roll with 11 and it's actually rare that teams start with 12 players and the best teams, their rotation is about seven or eight players. And so if you have perfect health for the most part, you can get by with 11 players. Right. And honestly, you can get by with 10 if you have perfect, perfect health. So they don't have to have 12. Like that was a goal for them last season is they were just set on having 12 players because, you know, they wanted to have depth. They wanted to be able to have it where, you know, nobody had to play too many minutes. But, you know, part of the problem was is that, yeah, they technically had 12 players, but 
like we were talking about in the beginning of this discussion, two of them weren't there in the beginning of the season. Christy Tolliver didn't come into the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, were knocked out of the Western Conference Finals, where she's an assistant coach on the Dallas Mavericks, which is appropriate. That's her, that's her. I would venture to say, and I think it's fair to say, that is probably her. That's her main job because mm. she spends more time on it, and I'm sure they pay her more money. Right. Okay. So it, it's it's tough. It's just, it's just tough the way you can can do this, but. If somebody is a, I won't say a salary cap sleuth, but if somebody's creative, they can really make this work if they are able to recruit and attract the type of talent you need to turn this around. But like you said, it's about culture. Um, so we'll get back into into some more free agency targets here in a minute. Um, but I don't know if we talked about Lexi Brown yet. Is that someone they're going to consider bringing back? Do you think they should bring her back? Yeah, Lexi Brown was a great shooter for them. Lexi Brown is somebody they had on basically a veteran's minimum contract. And I think that she's proven that she should probably make, you know, a decent amount more than that. This Mm -hmm. is, you know, former NBA slam dunk champion D Brown, you know, the peekable dunk. Mm -hmm. This this is her, that's her, uh, that so that's so she's the daughter of an NBA player so she gets this and her profession what she wants to do after she stops playing Lexi Brown wants to be a GM so she definitely understands you know what needs to happen to put together a salary so if they're honest with her and she's honest with them I think they can find a spot for her on this team she was great you know when she was starting she was great off the bench she got a little injured towards the second half of the season, I think it kind of threw her off, but her defense was good. And at one point, she was almost shooting 50% from three. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you can't you can't really buy that, if that makes sense. Like, that's, that's such a rare trait. And a team that has a player like NECA Ogumike, you're going to want as much shooting around NECA as possible because then that gives NECA room to work, you know, her inside-out game. No doubt about it. Um, so just real quick, I do have a few more questions for you. So we'll get to those in a second. Just want to remind you guys that you can find all of John W. Davis's work on the Sparks and on the WNBA over at ocregister.com or dailynews.com. Um, everything you need regarding coverage on the LA Sparks and more is over there at those websites. Um, this is a recorded space, so it will be available after we're done here. We're not done just yet, but when we are and, and you miss some of the conversation, you guys are more than welcome to go back to the beginning where we kind of touch on uh, Candace Parker, some of the WNBA playoff stuff. Um, maybe we'll get into that a little bit more, too, um, ahead of tomorrow's game, I believe. But, um, yep. yeah, just, just wanted to do some of that. John, did you have something real quick you wanted to add? Oh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to thank all of the people who are in the room. It's nice to see dozens it of people in here, you know, listening to James and I talk about this. And, you know, like he was saying, you know, follow our coverage because, you know, we are at the Orange County Register, LA Daily News, Southern California News Group. We are like one of the only organizations that has, you know, that's right. Full-time beat coverage. And, you know, it's the games can, can kind of stack up. I remember there was a stretch where there was four games in seven days. And so it, it takes work to cover the WNBA. And so we Mm -hmm. appreciate you, you know, following us and, and reading, and consuming the content yeah no doubt no doubt about it and again we will get to more questions we're not finished but john brings up a good point um obviously compared to a lot of other markets maybe outside of new york where there there's like two teams for every sport right in the nfl the nba the nhl um etc etc so you know usually the wnba gets the short end of the stick sometimes in other markets but or even for other organizations in la but when it comes to us We try to make it a point to prioritize the WNBA and and the coverage of that team as much as we possibly can, especially when there's two of every teams, uh, two of every team um, or or every or every league has two teams in this area. So for us to still um, prioritize the the sparks, I think is important. So um, hopefully you guys continue to support John and our coverage in that regard. But, John, uh, we just got done talking about guard Lexi Brown, another guard who I'm not sure if we mentioned quite yet. 
Um, but if anything, maybe a little bit more detail on her. Brittany Sykes, uh, who who is uh, oh, yeah. has yeah. been what the last the last all um, WNBA all defensive teams are like the last three seasons, correct? Yeah, yeah. One year she was first team, and then she was first team, but sandwiched in between that second team. And then one year she was a runner up for defensive player of the year, which, you know, a guard hasn't won that award in decades, it seems like. Um, but yeah, so Brittany Sykes, this is the crazy thing about Brittany Sykes. And, and I love Brittany Sykes. Her nickname is Slim. Great player. So Brittany Sykes, remember how I talked about how a lot of the veterans have these protected contracts? Mm hmm. Technically, Brittany Sykes never had a protected contract. So this was an all-defensive player who didn't have a protected contract. They weren't going to move on from her, but, you know. And I also think that Brittany Sykes, for the last two years, has played below her market value. So I think Brittany Sykes is another one of those people behind NECA where you basically say, like, you know, how much money do we have to pay you to be on this team? I think she's earned that from the Sparks, and if she doesn't get it from the Sparks, she's going to get it somewhere. Like Somebody is going to open up the checkbook for Brittany Sykes because yeah. like she plays intense defense. She can take you to the hoop, and her three ball is getting better. Like I don't know what else you can really ask her to do right. other than tell her I'm going to pay you more money, and I want you to keep that same energy. I mean, that's that's basically it. And so, like, you know, she, she just has to get paid this offseason, in my opinion. So I think the Sparks need to be willing to pay her more than they paid her last season, the last couple seasons. I think they did a great job acquiring her from the Atlanta Dream a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. But now it's time to prioritize her as one of the highest paid players on this team. If they're not willing to do that, then I think Brittany should leave. But hopefully they are. Gotcha. Um, if you look up at the big screen there in the Twitter spaces, um, a question of sort from Blazer Bucks investor, um, who kind of, uh, at least it, it leads me to a question that, that I'm, I guess I'm curious about, but it says uh, Sparks could get a coach and some players on one-year deals if they want to go the Connecticut Sun route. Well, what is the Connecticut Sun route? Fill me in. So, yeah, they could do one-year deals, but they've been, they've been pushing this down the they've been pushing this down the kicking the can down the road far too long. Mm -hmm. Like the culture needs to change. They need somebody who they truly believe in. They need somebody who the the GM needs a coach who believes in and vice versa. Like they need that solved up. They need. They just need a lot. So, yeah, you can go the one-year route, but I don't think that's going to work because, like, I think Brittany Sykes deserves a multi-year protected contract at mm -hmm. her market rate. Neka Agumake, if she resigns, deserves a multi-year max contract. And so I think you have to tie yourself to longer than one-year deals if you really want to show that, you know, you're committed to these players. Because, yeah, you can do a one-year and try to pay, you know, above. But, you know, why why take one year at – I'm just going to throw out a number. Why take one year at 150 when, you know, somebody may give you 440 over three years? Right. No, it, that doesn't – to me, that doesn't work for me. And if it doesn't work for me, I don't really see why that would work for them. <laughs> but, yeah, no, they, they just have to commit. Right. They have a, they have a lot of uh, committing to do. Uh, again, just wanted to circle back on the free agency talk a little bit. Um, who are some other targets outside of Candace Parker that <laughs> that the the first uh, call, the first call at midnight? Candace Parker should be, okay. but yeah, other than her, like <laughs> you know, I, I still need to go, <laughs> I still need to go through and and see you know exactly who's going to be a free agent that's right. you know realistic for the Sparks. I mean, I know somebody like Brianna Stewart is going to be a free agent, but I don't think that's realistic yeah. but I do think that you can realistically with the mindset of free agency realistically make some trades 
to acquire some people during the free agency period, if that makes sense. So in a roundabout way, that allows me to talk about somebody like Skylar Diggins-Smith, who at the end of the year was not happy in Phoenix. That didn't, that wasn't working for her. Was that publicly known? Or did she, did she kind of? Yeah. I mean, at the, at the end of the year, she stopped playing. Okay. For personal be, reasons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she stopped playing. They even made playoffs. She didn't play. So, mm. okay. you know, again, NECA knows everybody. Everybody knows NECA. I know that they're cool. Mm-hmm. You, know, you make a call to the Phoenix Mercury and say, oh, that, I hear Skyler's not even going to play next year. Mm. Y'all, y'all really think y'all can get her back? You know, you, you call them like that. And, and then if they're honest with themselves, like if whatever is going on with her is irreparable, Mm-hmm. Then they might just have to let her go. So then you figure out how to do it. You, you, if you take, if you have to take on salary to get draft picks to move them over to Phoenix and a like a almost like a three team deal, you do what you got to do. You know, another another person who I think I know that she's technically under contract with the Seattle Storm, but if Brianna Stewart decides to leave, I could see Jewel Lloyd becoming available on the market. Just because, you know, at that point, you might as well do a full rebuild. Or Jewel could say, oh, you know what? Hey, it's my time to shine. I'm going to drop 22 points a game. She could, but L.A. has always been uh, a place that I think appeals to her. You know, being the, the Kobe Bryant connection, I know that she has, you know, a strong connection with, you know, Kyrie. She has a strong connection with Phil Handy. Like, she just has connections here. So, to me, that makes sense, but like all of this is is conjecture at this point. But I mean, that's what free agency and trades are about. Like you have to dream big and go for it. Like I remember saying that, you know, one year when Diana Tarazi was a free agent, I said the Sparks should call, should call her. Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't going to happen. Like she wasn't going to come here, but like she has a SoCal connection. She's from here, so that's what I'm saying. A lot of people have some sort of connection to Southern California or LA specifically. And if you have any kind of end with somebody, I think you got to use it and really try to revamp this roster. Gotcha. Um, I I do want to ask you about the WNBA playoffs here in a minute, but we do have some conversations and some, uh, some different questions going in. I put some of them in there on the, on the big screen there. If you want to address some of them, Um, Demo asked, uh, is the gentleman responsible for Candace and Chelsea's departure still involved with the team? Because I I could be wrong, but I don't think any free agent wants to be there if D Fish is there. So I'm assuming he's talking about Derek Fisher. Derek um, Fisher is no longer with the organization. He is not the coach or the GM. And then um, I don't just if you want to scroll through. Oh, I see. Isabel Harris yeah. would be a great pickup. Mm-hmm. Same with John Quill Jones. We need size and scoring. Here's a, so here's a cool fact. So technically, John Quill Jones, when she was drafted in 2016, I was just looking at it. She was drafted with the number six pick overall, which was in that draft. It was the L.A. Sparks pick. But the L.A. Sparks traded that pick to get Chelsea Gray. So, I mean, they they did well. Like, it yeah. worked out for the Sparks. But, like, technically, like, it was John Quill. So, Yeah. I could see, I could see eventually the Connecticut Sun, especially if this finals doesn't go the way they wanted to, like eventually that's got to break up. Like they just can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and expecting it to be better. Right. Like, because there's always going to be something like, oh, they, they might say, oh yeah, we might've won if Jasmine Thomas wasn't hurt. Like there's always something. You just can't have a perfect season. So, Sure, if if Robin, if Robin, you can recruit John Quill Jones to the LA Sparks, I'm sure they'd have her, and I'm sure they'd pay her the maximum they could offer her. Gotcha. Uh, do we want to talk about contract divorces and, and Liz Cambage for a second, or are you ready to talk about the WNBA playoffs? Wait, I'm still scrolling through. We need to okay. core and pay slim. So that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting concept. So they have this thing where you can technically, like – core somebody almost like a franchise tag where Mm -hmm. you say like you can't go anywhere 
you got to play for us, but we're going to compensate you for it. Yeah, you can technically do that. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. But if it does, you know, do it. Um, do I want to talk about Liz Cohen Beige? What do you yeah. want to talk about? I'm just, I guess for me, I'm just kind of, look, I think it was either days or a week before it all happened. She was at the SB Awards. I think I told you this. She was at the SB Awards. Mm -hmm. I think she was there with some other WNBA players. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to she remember if, if one of the Akuma K's was like literally there with her or not. I, I can't remember. I do remember seeing Liz because it's like, you know, it's Liz. Um, right. And she's all smiles, all happy. And of course, that's not on the court or, or in, in, you know, at practice and whatnot. But what went wrong there? Because I, you know, she was, she seemed fine to me. I mean, again, this is just at the red carpet. This is just very brief. I didn't talk to her about it. I, I didn't talk to her at all. If I would have known some of this was going on, maybe I would have tried to talk to her about it. But anyway. Well, I, don't, I don't think anybody knew what was going on. It all yeah. sort of came to a head against a former team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if my order of events is correct. So I remember Liz did the SBs, mm -hmm. and then I think the All-Star break was a little bit after that. Yeah. So during All Star break around that time, she contracted COVID, which was she said it was the third time she had it. Right. So that set her back. She's able to come back. She plays in just a couple more games after that. The last game being against her former team, the Las Vegas Aces in Vegas. The Sparks got whooped in that game. And then that Liz didn't want to play for the Sparks anymore. Now, Obviously, there's probably a lot more to it, but that's my simple version of it. You know, Liz, you know, cited the fact that she wanted to, after the season, she cited the fact that she wanted to take a break from basketball in the WNBA, you know, and to, to work on her mental health and things like that. But Liz is a person with outside of basketball interests, which is great. I don't think anybody should only be interested in one thing. Right. You know, like, like even the greatest of the greatest players, they're into something else. Yeah. So, you know, I know that modeling is important to her. She just was in New York doing Fashion Week, I think. You know, she's a notable DJ, but I think, oh. yeah. I, what'd you say? I said I didn't know she was a DJ. Yeah, she, she, she's a DJ. Yeah, she can command, she can command um, appearance fees to DJ. Okay. I didn't know that. So, but, yeah, it it just didn't work out, and I don't think she was ever in the proper playing shape this season. And then, especially after coming back from COVID, mm -hmm. like it just it just didn't work for her. Like, and in theory, it makes sense. Like, oh, you want a six nine player next to Neca? It makes sense in theory, but in application, it just didn't work out because I don't think the Sparks ever got the best version. Of uh, Liz Cambage, and I don't think Liz Cambage was at her best version for herself either. And so, when you put all of those things together, you know the the team, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. even with Liz, it looked like the team had a ceiling. Like they didn't look like they would be playing against the Connecticut Sun in in the finals right now, or against the Aces in the finals right now. They didn't seem like that type of team. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I think it was just too much for. Her. She, Got she bowed out. Okay, okay. Uh, real quick, just want to give a shout out to Demo, to Robin, and to uh, Blaze Blazer Bucks investor there for some of the um, just the conversation they were having throughout um, some of the Twitter Space thread that I saw, and and just for giving us a few topics there to talk about some good stuff from them. So a special shout out to them. Um, as we get ready to kind of wrap things up here, don't leave yet, folks. I just want to. Um, make sure you guys stay tuned a little bit longer here. But, John, the WNBA playoffs, as you just mentioned, is going on, the finals. Uh, your thoughts on what is it, the Aces? Are, the Aces are up 2-0? Yep, the Aces are up 2-0 against the Sun. I mean, basically what the Aces did was hold serve. They won the first two games on their home court. Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. Right. Now we'll have to see how the Connecticut Sun respond on Thursday night. You would think – you know, from the outside looking in, you would think, oh, this series is over because yeah. they're up 2-0 and all they got to do is win one out of the next three. But to quote Lee Corso, I call him my friend because I saw him in the airport one time. So now okay. we're friends. 
Mm-hmm. Not so fast, my friend. Nah. <laughs> like, I, I still don't think the Connecticut Suns defense has thrown their best effort at Chelsea Gray. I've seen Connecticut year after year mm-hmm. defend Chelsea Gray in a way that causes her to have a lot of pressure. Like, they like to trap her. Now, they haven't really done that too much because I think Chelsea Gray and Becky Hammond oftentimes is not even putting the ball in Chelsea Gray's hand to bring it up to court to be trapped because now they have Kelsey Plum. So now I feel like Chelsea Gray finally has – she has a dance partner. So somebody who can, like, truly take the ball up to court, take that pressure off of her. So then – You know, by the time they want to do that, you can't really, you know, trap her at the three-point line because she's so close, she's whipping around, and that's a, you know, one of those crazy behind-the-back passes, and that's two points. But if they could get her, if they're able to pick her up, um, you know, three-quarters court, ride her down, and maybe, you know, call a half-court trap or something like that, then yes. But the thing about it is, They've been playing Chelsea Gray like that for years. And so maybe finally now she's just matured out of that through scheme and through coaching and everything else where that just can't affect her anymore. And so maybe this just ends in three or four. I right. don't think I don't think it's going back to Las Vegas in this series. I, yep. I just I could definitely see Connecticut winning game three. And then obviously if you win game three, you got a chance to win game four, but I think the Aces, when they go back, I think it'll be for a parade. What was uh, what were what was the biggest difference, or how impactful was Becky Hammond for the Aces this year? Okay, here's a stat. So, <laughs> in the first four years, Avery mm-hmm. Wilson shot two three pointers. Oh wow! Guess how, guess how many three pointers she shot this last year, her fifth year in the in league. I would imagine more than two. Guess. Ten. Eighty-three. Excuse me? You said two to eighty-three? Two for her whole career. She she had two seasons where she didn't even attempt a three. And, and she so has- Becky Becky Hammond comes in and says, Hey, do your thing. Because I knew Asia could shoot last season. The this last season she was one of one for three, but I knew she could shoot because the first game I watched the the preseason game, it was the Aces. They were here playing L.A. And uh-huh. the shooting stroke looked good. I'm like, oh, man, she could shoot. Because this is the thing. She's 6'5". And, yeah, that's tall in women's basketball. But in the sport of basketball, 6'5 is a two guard. Right. So, like, there's nothing that says anybody in the WNBA can't shoot. That's why John Quill Jones can shoot. Like, that's the great thing about the WNBA players in that league have the ability to do everything on the court if they develop those skills. And so she worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, finally has a coach that is allowing her to shoot three-pointers, mm-hmm. empowering her to shoot three-pointers, and she shot 37%. So she went from taking two threes her whole career to shooting 37%. And now she's the MVP, just won Defensive Player of the Year, on track to win Finals MVP, and so, yes, I think Becky Hammond was a huge impact on her with that. But then I also think Becky Hammond, you know, she unlocked Kelsey Plum. Like mm-hmm. She elevated her. Like Kelsey Plum told her, I'm going to be a dog. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. Becky said, okay. And she let her show her. And she showed herself to be what she said she was going to be. And then you have Chelsea Gray. This is the crazy thing. Mm-hmm. So, the Aces have the Aces have four All Stars in the All Star game. Mm-hmm. It was in Chicago. Um, guess who wasn't an All Star for the Aces? Uh, don't say Chelsea Gray. Chelsea Gray. She was the only one who wasn't an All Star, and now she's essentially player one A. Yeah. So. You know, it, it just all worked out for them. And mm. I just I just don't see how they don't win one of these last three games. Definitely probably one of the next two. No. It's just, it's just working right now, man. It's, and it's great to see. 
Yeah, it's great to see, and we love to see it. We love to see the WNBA doing well and getting the attention it deserves. John, we talked a whole hour about the Ooh. WNBA, and I, I love loved it. I loved the conversation with you. Uh, I appreciated everyone that was in here. Some people who were in here from the very beginning, um, I appreciate you guys. And for everyone who popped in, in and out, throughout, um, this was fun. And, John, if, if, if the people want WNBA Twitter – and and Twitter Spaces from us, just say that. So right, um, right. Just let us know. Hey, can I give a shout out to a couple of my friends? In the room? You can go ahead. Shout out. So everybody. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to single people out, but I want to give a shout out to. I'm looking on the list. I want to give a shout out to Mia, B. Terrell, mm-hmm. Miles, 808, Robin. I think I saw a Muffin down there somewhere. So shout out to a couple of the people that I know from WMA Twitter. But shout out to everybody for yeah. being in here, just because. I know people are super passionate about the WNBA and you may not see me tweeting that much about it right now. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm not watching and it doesn't mean that I don't care. And it doesn't mean that we're not still planning and thinking about it from the sparks perspective and the league wide perspective. But again, I'm kind of just waiting on this coach GM thing to shake out. And then I feel like the sparks can get going. So, I mean, to me, the ball is in their court, no pun intended. And once they do something, then we can start to talk about and analyze some of these ripple effects. No doubt about it. And and a shout out to everyone that John mentioned. And again, just everyone that's been in, in the spaces as well as they mentioned uh, before. Uh, this is something we're going to try and do weekly, not just with John, but with some of the other members of the Southern California News Group that I work with. Again, for more coverage on the Sparks and stuff from John and everybody else, uh, go to ocregister.com or dailynews.com. Make sure you follow myself, but also make sure if you're not following John, that you're following John for all um, WNBA and Sparks coverage. Um, Again, John, this has been fun, and I think we'll we'll have to be doing this again sometime in the very near future. All right, well, let's, let's tentatively decide we will definitely talk if not mm-hmm. before, but definitely by the time that the Sparks hire a GM and or a coach. That sounds good to me. We'll, we'll be in touch um, before then, but when that comes around, we'll, we'll be in touch at that time too. That time too. So um, again, thank you guys so much and we'll see you in the next one. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.